episode four of Werewolf the Podcast. My name's Will, I'm your werewolf host, and this is Werewolf the Podcast. Please go back and listen to the previous three episodes, then this would make a bit more sense. I am currently being interrogated by the British Army. I don't often get to tell my story, so this is an opportunity that I'm going to take with both hands. I was actually going to enjoy telling someone the truth. I have to hide it normally. Well, truth. The truth-ish, if that's a word. To be honest, this is about the life of a real monster. A half-man, half-wolf. There's a lot of death, destruction, gore and snot in this story. So if you're ever upset by those things, I won't listen any further. I also swear quite a bit, murder women and children and have no real moral compass. Well, that's what people say, but hey, who cares what people say? I found that not caring about the consequences of my actions, not having any real empathy or any of that emotional bollocks, like that just means that I can do just what the fuck I want. The thing I most want to do is to ruin society and hurt people. I like hurting people. It's one of my favourite things to do. No, scratch that. It's it's my favourite thing to do. It's 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 my art to work with death and destruction and add a pinch of subtle cruelty. The story I tell is one that not you or anyone else will understand. But you asked. I mean, I'm so goddamn amazing that everyone should hear about me. Really, get ready to listen to the most fantastic story of your life, Mr. Army Man. My unreal name is Will De Beast. For you less able thinkers, if you read it or listen to it, which I assume you do, my not real name sounds like Wild Beast. My real name I would rather keep a secret, but I'm not a Keith. I was born in 1974 in Birch Hill Hospital in Rochdale. I came roaring and screaming into this world a red and bloody mess. It was an easy birth and I looked normal to all the doctors. Ten fingers, ten toes, but apparently was quite a hairy newborn, but some are. Rochdale is a town in the northwest of England that is famed for the beginning of the co-op shopping movement over in the UK and not really a lot else to be honest. Oh wait, there was an amazing singer in the 80s from there called Lisa Stansfield. These days it is known for being the chucky starfish crapsville of the UK, absorbing the scum not wanted from other parts of the country. A lot of the town is filled with those booted out of council estates in other places for their behaviour, so you can imagine it's a really classy place. It's a former mill town where many miserable people spun cotton before getting crushed by heavy machinery or dying in childbirth or of cholera or of just being a fucking miserable northerner. Since those halcyon days it has fallen into a state of decline. In the last few decades many of the now empty mills have been demolished or turned into flats or just generally left to rot and fall into lack of use. Dereliction and junkification, not gentrification, is the name of the game in Rochdale. For most of my early childhood, I lived in a part of it called Spotland. It's quite close to the tops, or the moors as we call them. They're kind of not quite mountains, but bigger than hills. Significant areas of bleak wasteland where there are lots of sheep. I mean, lots of sheep. I mean... Lots of sheep. Oh, and in our part of the country, it was not a pastime to shag them. The local population are actually easier to sleep with and less choosy than any fucking sheep. Watch UK daytime telly shows and you will see the toothless morons that live in this once industrious town festoon the great shows like Jeremy Kyle. The moors had once been covered in trees. It was difficult to believe when you saw the heather and rough grass that covered them now but the moors had once been forested. The trees had been cut down and had gone because of the people in the area that needed more pastoral land for the sheep and or wood for fires. They really needed big warm fires as it is really cold and miserably grim up north. As a child, 
I would love to go onto the moor when they would swathe the land in the autumn. This was when they would set huge controlled burns of the dry heather and grass that covered the moorland. These burns would kill off any new shrub or tree growth and would reseed the land with ash fertiliser. This would then set the scene for fresh green grass in the spring. The burns were my first introduction to chaos and control chaos. The idea is that we burn and destroy in order to make better. It was a risky thing to do. The burns, as sometimes the winds would change direction quickly and the fires would get out of control. This would often lead to damage to local buildings and would kill a few sheep and or people. If I really tried, I could get all sorts of things to happen and make it look like an accident. I was living on a lovely middle class housing estate with parents who were seeking to be middle class, surrounded by the middle class prats that thought themselves better than those chavs a mile down the road. If you're not British, then chavs may need a description. It's an acronym for council housed and violent. Shell suits and caps, urban rednecks might make sense. The housing estate was at the top of Ings Lane. Ings Lane was once a pack horse road that went over the tops and took traffic into the next valley. This was when donkeys and old women were the primary forms of transport from valley to valley in Lancashire and Yorkshire. The road had evolved through time and now had become a long, wide main artery through the suburban outskirts of Rochdale. Ings Lane snaked its way up onto the moors from the centre of Rochdale and it had the homes of the poorest bastards that lived in the crappy town along it. A council housing estate was below our superior middle class zone for the middle class people. It was a sprawling cesspit known as the breeding ground for crime and delinquency. Above our middle class zone, further up the road, were the houses of the posh people. This area was Lanehead, and my family always dreamed of buying a house up there. Why they would want views of the local council estate, I never really knew. When I was young, I noticed that I could see and interact with things others could not. When I told my family about these things, they laughed and smiled along with these little childish hallucinations. It was the amazing imagination of a young child. Eventually... They became a little disturbed by them and took me to the doctors. The doctors questioned me and they, in turn, got worried about my mental state. So I soon learnt to shut the fuck up about the things I saw. Otherwise, I would never get off these meds that made me sleepy and would always be on the special kids table in school with the kids that blew snot bubbles and drank the fucking paint. As a child, I was labelled as stupid, nasty and lazy. This was not really the case. Well, the stupid and lazy bits were probably not justified. I think the problem stemmed from the coaching efforts of my posit. He's the wolf side of me. He taught me that no one could make me do anything I did not want to do. So to try to get me to do something I did not want to do was therefore impossible. To tell me off was like trying to rebuke a brick wall for all the effect it had. Even from nursery age, my report home contained sentences such as Does not play well with others. The other kids, well, they didn't tend to approach me or interact with me from day one. I showed little interest in them to be honest. Even at such an early age, they knew that I was something that should be left alone and not bothered. I was often intentionally cruel at school but was held back from anything deemed too much by my ever-present posit. I wish people could have seen the colossal wolf wandering around the classroom of small children. I'm sure if they could have seen it, it may have affected their viewpoint on their choice of school for their little ones. I was never frightened or scared with my big best friend always reassuring me and telling me how to react and respond to any situation. I went to my first school in Rochdale. It was called Meanwood Primary School and it was all about being mean. I'd been raised by parents who had no time to build any relationship with me. They only had time to make money to put food on the table. They worked so hard to achieve their middle class status that it was the cost that their family's emotional well-being would be gone. My father left the house before I woke up and returned home after I went to bed. The only time that I saw him was on the weekends when he was grumpy and tired. His building business was going well, but he filled any required role, so he was always exhausted. 
He also came from a traditional manly background, which meant that he was emotionally stunted, to say the least. They were not bad parents. They had been brought up to work hard to get the most out of life. There was no emotional intimacy shown to me. Luckily, I had my posit with me, always, my sensei and my mentor. It felt great, finally telling the chief my story. I couldn't wait to continue. If you enjoyed the story, that's the end of episode 4, please go down and buy me a coffee. There's a link in the description. If you haven't enjoyed it, sorry. Sorry for wasting a few minutes of your life. As always, at the end of every episode, I'd just like to tell you, I love you. <laughs>